Hi Year 6 and welcome to Friday's Reading Home Learning and today we're going to start reading chapter 8 which is a very long chapter so we're going to read quite a lot of chapter 8 today. So chapter 8, Flies and Spiders. They walked in single file. The entrance to the path was like a sort of arch leading into a gloomy tunnel made by two trees that leant together. Too old and strangled with ivy and hung with lynchen to bear more than a few blackened leaves. The path itself was narrow and wound in and out among the trunks. Soon the light at the gate was like a bright little hole far behind and the quiet was so deep that their feet seemed to thump along while all the trees leaned over them and listened. As their eyes became used to the dimness they could see a little way to either side in a sort of darkened green glimmer. Occasionally a slender beam of sun that had the luck to slip in through some opening in the leaves far above, and still more luck to not being caught in the tangled boughs and matted twigs beneath, stabbed down thin and bright before them. But this was seldom, and it soon ceased altogether. There were black squirrels in the woods. As Bilbo's sharp, inquisitive eyes got used to seeing things, he could catch glimpses of them whisking off the path and scuttling behind tree trunks. There were queer noises too, grunts, scufflings and hurryings in the undergrowth and among the leaves that lay piled endlessly thick in places on the forest floor. But what made the noises he could not see. The nastiest things they saw were the cobwebs, dark dense cobwebs with threads extraordinarily thick, often stretched from tree to tree or tangled in the lower branches on either side of them. There were none stretched across the path. But whether because some magic kept it clear, or for what other reason, they could not guess. It was not long before they grew to hate the forest as heartily as they had hated the tunnels of the goblins, and it seemed to offer even less hope of any ending. But they had to go on and on, long after they were sick of the sight of the sun on the sky, and longed for the feel of the wind on their faces. There was no movement of air down under the forest roof, and it was everlastingly still and dark and stuffy. Even the dwarfs felt it, who were used to tunnelling and lived at times for long whiles without the light of the sun. But the hobbit, who liked holes to make a house in but not to spend summer days in, felt that he was being slowly suffocated. The nights were the worst. It then became pitch dark, not what you call pitch dark, but really pitch, so black that you could see nothing. Bilbo tried flapping his hand in front of his nose, but he could not see it at all. Well, perhaps it's not true to say that they could not see nothing. They could see eyes. They slept all closely huddled together and took it in turns to watch. And when it was Bilbo's turn, he would see gleams in the darkness round them. And sometimes pairs of yellow or red or green eyes would stare at him from a little distance and then slowly fade and disappear and slowly shine out again in another place. And sometimes they would gleam down from the branches just above him. And that was the most terrifying. But the eyes that he liked the least were horrible, pale, bulbous sort of eyes. Insect eyes, he thought. Not animal eyes. Only they are too much too big. Although it was not yet very cold, they tried lighting watch fires at night. But they soon gave that up. It seemed to bring hundreds and hundreds of eyes all round them. Though the creatures, whatever they were were careful never to let their bodies show in the light, little flicker of the flames. Worse still, it brought thousands of dark grey and black moths, some nearly as big as your hand, flapping and whirring round your ears. They could not stand that, nor the huge bats, black as a top hat either, so they, end up, they gave up fires and sat at night and dozed in the enormous uncanny darkness. All this went on for what seemed to the hobbit ages upon ages, and he was always hungry, for they were extremely careful with their provisions. Even so, as some days followed, and still the forest seemed just the same, they began to get anxious. The food would not last forever, it was in fact already beginning to get low. They tried shooting at squirrels, and they wasted many arrows before they managed to bring one down on the path, but when they roasted it, it proved horrible to taste and they shot no more squirrels. They were thirsty too, for they had none too much water, and all the time they had seen neither spring nor stream. 
This was their state when one day they found their path blocked by a running water. It flowed fast and strong, but not very wide, right across the way, and it was black, or looked it in it in the gloom. It was well that it was the well that Bjorn had warned them against it, or they would have drunk it, whatever its colour, and filled some of their empty skins at its banks. As it was, they only thought of how to cross it without wetting themselves in its water. There had been a bridge of wood across, but it had rotted and fallen, leaving only broken posts near the bank. Bilbo, kneeling on the brink and peering forward, cried, There is a boat aside the far bank. Now why couldn't it have been this side? How far away do you think it is? asked Thorin, for by now they knew Bilbo had the sharpest eyes among them. Not at all far. I should think about twelve yards. Twelve yards? I should have thought it was thirty at least, but my eyes don't see as well as they used to, a hundred years ago. Still, twelve yards is as good as a mile. We can't jump it, and we don't try to wade or swim. Can any of you throw a rope? What's the good of that? The boat is sure to be pied up, tied up, even if we could hick it, which I doubt. I don't believe it is tied, said Bilbo. Of course, I can't be sure in this light, but it looks to me as if it was just drawn up on the bank, which is low, just there where the path goes down in the water. Dory is the strongest, but Philly is the youngest and still has the best sight, said Thorin. Come here, Philo, Philly, and see if you can see the boat Mr Baggins is talking about. Philly thought he could, so when he had stared a long while to get the idea of the direction, the others bought him a rope. They had several with them, and on one of the end they fastened one of the large iron hooks they had used for catching their packs to the straps about their shoulders. Philly took this in his hand, balanced it for a moment, and then flung it across the stream. Splash! It fell in the water. Not far enough, said Bilbo, who was peering forward. A couple of feet and you would have dropped it on the boat. Try again. I don't suppose the magic is strong enough to hurt you if you touch a bit of wet rope. Philly picked up the hook when he had drawn it back, rather doubtfully at the same. This time he threw it with great strength. Steady, said Bilbo. You have thrown it right into the wood on the other side now. Draw it back gently. Philly hauled the rope back slowly and after a while Bilbo said, Carefully, carefully. It's lying on the boat. Let's hope the hook will catch. It did. The rope went taunt and Pil Philly pulled in vain. Killy came to help and then Oin and Gloin. They tugged and tugged and suddenly they all fell over on their backs. Bilbo was on the lookout, however, caught the rope and with a piece of stick fended off the little black boat as it came rushing across the stream. Help! he shouted and Barlin was just in time to seize the boat before it floated off down the current. It was tied after all, said he, looking at the snap painter that was still dangling from it. That was a good pull, my lads, and a good job that our rope was the stronger. Who'll cross first? asked Bilbo. I shall, said Thorin, and you will come with me, and Philly and Barlin. That's as many as the boat will hold at a time. After that, Killy and Oin and Gloin and Dory, and next, Ori and Nori, Biffer and Boffer, and last, Dwalin and Bomber. I'm always last and I don't like it, said Bomber. It's someone else's turn today. Should not be so fat. As you are, you must be with the last and lightest boatload. Don't start grumbling against orders or something bad will happen to you. There aren't any oars. Now are you going to push the boat back to the far bank, asked the hobbit. Give me another length of rope and another hook, said Billy. And when they had got it ready, he cast it into the darkness ahead and as high as he could throw it. Since it did not fall down again, they saw that it must have stuck in the branches. Get it now, said Billy, and one of you haul on the rope that is stuck in the tree on the other side. One of the others must keep hold of the hook we used at first, and when we are safe on the other side, he can hick it on, and you can draw the boat back. In this way, they were all soon on the far bank, safe across the enchanted stream. Dwalin had just scrambled out with the coiled rope in his arm, and Bomber, still grumbling, was getting ready to follow when something bad did happen. There was a flying sound of hooves on the path ahead. Out of the gloom came suddenly the shape of a flying deer. It charged into the dwarves and bowled them over, then gathered itself for a leap. High it sprang and cleared the water with a mighty jump, 
but he had not reached the other side in safety. Thorin was the only one who had kept his feet and his wits. As soon as they had landed, he had bent his bow and fitted an arrow in case any hidden guardian of the boat appeared. Now he sent a swift and sure shot into the leaping beast as it reached the further bank it stumbled. The shadows swallowed it up, but they heard the sound of hooves quickly falter and then go still. Before they could shout praise of the shot, however, a dreadful wail from Bilbo put all thoughts of venison out of their minds. Bomber has fallen in! Bomber is drowning! he cried. It was only too true. Bomber had only one foot on land when the heart bore him down and sprang over him. He had stumbled, thrusting the boat from away from the bank and then toppled back in the dark water, his hands slipping off the slimy roots at the edge, while the boat span slowly off and disappeared. They could still see his hood above the water when they ran to the bank. Quickly they flung a rope with a hook towards him. His hand caught it and they pulled him ashore. He was drenched from hair to boots, of course, but that was not the worst. When they laid up him on the bank, he was already fast asleep with one hand clutching the rope so tightly they would not get it from his grasp, and fast asleep he remained in spite of all they could do. They were still standing over him, cursing their little ill luck and Bomber's clumsiness, and lamenting the loss of the boat which made it impossible for them to go back and look for the heart, when they became aware of the dim blowing of horns in the wood, and the sound as the dogs baying far off. Then they all fell silent as they sat it seemed they could hear the noise of a great hunt going on to, to the north of the path, though they saw no sign of it. There they sat for a long while and did not dare to make a move. Bomber slept on with a smile on his fat face, as if he had no longer care for the troubles that vexed him. Suddenly on the path ahead appeared some white deer, a hind and fawns, as snowy white as the heart had been dark. They glimmered in the shallows. Before Thorin could cry out, three of the dwarves had leaped to their feet and loosed off what arrows from their bows. None seemed to find the mark. The deer turned and vanished in the trees as silently as they had come, and in vain the dwarves shot their arrows after them. Stop! Stop! shouted Thorin, but it was too late. The excited dwarves had wasted their last arrows, and now the bows that Bjorn had given them were useless. They were a gloomy party that night and the gloom gathered still deeper on them in the following days. They had crossed the enchanted stream, beyond, but beyond it the path seemed to straggle on just as bef before, and in the forest they could see no change. Yet if they had known more about it and considered the meaning of the hunt and the white deer that had appeared upon their path, they would have known that they were at least drawing towards the eastern edge, and would soon have come, if they had kept up their courage and their hope, to thinner trees and places where the sunlight came again. But they did not know this, and they were burdened with the heavy body of Bomber, which they had to carry along with them as best they could, taking the wearisome task in turns of four each, while the others shared their packs. If these had not become all too light in the last few days, they would never have managed it, but a slumbering and smiling Bomber was a poor exchange for packs filled with food, however heavy. In a few days a time came, when there was practically nothing left to eat or to drink. Nothing wholesome could they see growing in the wood, only funguses and herbs with pale leaves and unpleasant smell. About four days from the enchanted stream, they came to a part where most of the trees were beeches. There they, they were at first inclined to be cheered by the change, for here there was no undergrowth and the shadow was not so deep. There was a greenish light about them, and in places they could see some distance to either side of the path. Yet the light only showed them endless lines of straight grey trunks, like the pillars of some huge twilight hall. There was a breath of air and a noise of wind, but it had a sad sound. A few leaves came rustling down to remind them that outside autumn was coming on. Their feet ruffled against the dead leaves of countless other autumns that drifted over the banks of the path from the deep red carpets of the forest. Still Bomber slept, and they grew very weary. At times they heard disquieting laughter. Sometimes there was singing in the distance too. The laughter was laughter of fair voices, not of goblins, and the singing was beautiful. But it sounded eerie and strange, and they were not comforted. Rather they hurried on from those parts, with what strength they had left. Two days later they found their path going downwards, and before long they were in a valley, 
filled almost entirely with the mighty growth of oaks. Is there no end to this accursed forest? said Thorin. Somebody must climb a tree and see if he can get his head above the roof and have a look around. The only way it is to choose the tallest tree that overhangs the path. Of course, somebody meant Bilbo. They chose him because to be any use, the climber must get his head above the topmost leaves, and so he must be light enough for the highest and slenderest branches to bear him. Poor Mr Baggins had never had much practice in climbing trees, but they hoisted him up into the lowest branches of an enormous oak that grew right out onto the path, and up he had to go as best he could. He pushed his way through the tangled twigs with many a slap in the eye, he was greened and grimed from the old bark of the greater boughs. More than once he slipped and caught himself just in time. And at last, after a dreadful struggle in a difficult place where there seemed to be no convenient branches at all, he got near the top. All the time he was wondering whether there were spiders in the tree and how he was going to get down again, except by falling. And as you can see, here is a picture of Bilbo in the tree. Join me on Monday and we're going to continue reading chapter 8. Well done for reading along with me today.